Hello, Music Theory 1. This is David Farrell, video number 25, a Musical Form 2. Today we're talking about period and sentence structures in music. This follows up on our last video in, in which we introduced some of the basics of musical form. We talked about phrase, motive, and cadence in that video. We're going to be building on those ideas in this video, and I'm going to take a moment to say that this material does go along with chapter 10 in your textbook, and I would strongly recommend taking a look through chapter 10, reading some of the explanations, and especially looking at some of the musical examples in the book for all the concepts that we talk about with form. I think they have some really good examples that illustrate the ideas we're talking about and seeing them and listening to them can be a really really helpful thing. With that in mind, let's move forward with today's new ideas. We started talking about form as how music is organized, how we can talk about the different elements of music and how they come together to create a piece, a composition, uh, how they create the different musical effects that we hear. Today we're going to be talking about some different types of structural units beyond the ideas of phrase and motive that we already talked about. The first one that we're going to talk about is an extremely common musical formation that we call a period. So let's go through our basics of what a period is. A period is a formal unit that's made up of two or sometimes more phrases. Most commonly periods are two phrases, but there are some we'll see that are a little bit larger. And those phrases form a particular relationship that we call antecedent and consequent. The first phrase is the antecedent phrase. And what makes this phrase the antecedent is that it has a weaker cadence and it has a feeling of open. The antecedent phrase needs to be resolved, it needs to be answered, it sort of leaves us hanging, wanting something strong. And the consequent phrase, the phrase that comes next, has a stronger cadence. And it feels closed, it feels like we've sort of resolved that openness. Okay, This is all we're talking about when we're talking about a period. We're talking about phrases that have this antecedent-consequent relationship, and the way we tell that is through the cadences through a weaker cadence, followed by a stronger cadence. That's the number one thing we need to know about a period. It's weak cadence, followed by strong cadence. Let's get right into a musical example. Let's take a listen to this piece of music. Very short, eight bars, organized into two phrases, and I've already done the analysis for you. When we listen to this grouping of two phrases, we do notice that we have different endings at the, uh, for each phrase, right? Each phrase starts very similarly, uh, but they end in a different way. They have a different cadence at the end. The first phrase has one of our weaker cadences. It has a half cadence, a cadence that stops on the dominant, that stops on five. And that's one of those cadences that leaves us hanging, that leaves us up in the air. We want that five to resolve to one. But we don't get that resolution right away. Instead, we start our next phrase. We start over, and we have to wait to the end of that phrase to really get that strong 5-1 in root position, that perfect authentic cadence at the end of the phrase. We could describe this music as a period. It's a grouping of two phrases that have an antecedent-consequent relationship. The first phrase has a weak ending, a weak cadence. It leaves us open, it leaves us wanting more. If we stopped the music right at the end of that first phrase, we would feel very incomplete and dissatisfied. And then the second phrase, the consequent phrase, has a strong ending with a perfect authentic cadence. And we feel pretty good about stopping right there. That's what makes this phrase a period. There are lots of ways we can describe periods. We can get very detailed in the way we talk about different things that happen inside of a period. For now, we're just going to use one way to describe our periods. We're going to describe our periods as being either parallel or contrasting periods. When we talk about whether a period is parallel or contrasting, we're talking about the motivic material that appears in our period. 
rather than the cadence at the end, we're talking about what's going on in the melody, what's going on in the music. Parallel periods have very similar motivic material between the two phrases. And in particular, in particular, they have very similar material at the beginning of the phrase. Parallel periods often start with the exact same beginning of a phrase or with a very, very minor variation. Contrasting periods have different motivic material at the beginning of the phrase. And so if we listen once more to the period we heard last time, we can tell that it was a parallel period. Those, the two phrases had the same motivic material, not just in the first bar, but in the first couple of measures of each phrase. This is what makes them parallel. We can draw a diagram for that phrase we just looked at. Phrase diagrams are something that we see quite commonly when we're analyzing music. Each small arch represents a phrase of music. You can see I've represented both of my phrases with a small arch, and you can see that I've labeled the cadences at the end of each phrase and where they occur. The first phrase had a half cadence in measure four. The second phrase had a perfect authentic cadence in measures seven and eight. Above these phrase markers, I've put a letter to designate the motivic material that happens in each phrase. I use the letter A for my first phrase, and since I've denoted this as a parallel period, since they both have similar motivic material, I use the same letter again. But because the phrase ends slightly differently, it's not the exact same, I labeled it as A prime with that little slash next to it. If we had had a contrasting period, I would have labeled this motivic material as B. Finally, I've put a large arch over the two phrases to indicate that they form a period. This is a simple phrase diagram. I'll draw a couple more for you throughout the course of this video, but it's something that we want to get comfortable doing as we analyze music. It's a nice way to represent a lot of information in a simple diagram. If I changed the material in the second phrase, the motivic material, I would change how we described this music. We can take a look and listen at, what, at what's going on in this excerpt. I took, have the same four measures, the same motivic material and the same cadence at the end, but notice that I've changed around what's going on in my second phrase. Let's take a listen to this version of the two phrases I wrote for you. The phrase is still a period. The cadence structure is intact. We still have that same antecedent consequent relationship. We still have a half cadence at the end of our first phrase and a perfect authentic cadence at the end of our second phrase. But this is no longer a parallel period because the motives have been changed quite a bit. The second phrase now has a very different motive. It has lots more moving notes, lots of stepwise motion compared to the big leaps that we had at the beginning of the first phrase. And the chords have been changed quite a bit as well. I would no longer call this a parallel period. Instead, I would call it a contrasting period. And again, you can see my phrase diagram at the bottom has changed slightly. I still have the two small arches to indicate each phrase and I have still indicated the two cadences and where they occur. But now I've labeled my motives as A, and as B to indicate that they're different, that they have different ideas happening in phrase one and phrase two, and that's why this is a contrasting period. A common variant on periods is a three-phrase period. A three-phrase period, as you might guess, adds an extra phrase. It's got three phrases rather than just two in it. Three-phrase periods can typically have two antecedent phrases, that have a weak or open cadence at the end, or they can have two consequent phrases, two strong or closed cadences at the end of them. Uh, when we look for these, we're still looking for that same relationship of weak cadence followed by strong cadence, just that sometimes here we might have a repeat or a two of a ca particular cadence in a row before we finally get that closure we're looking for. Let's take a look and listen at an example. Our example has gotten longer here. Let's take a listen to it and see what's going on.
we still have that sense of weak cadence that needs to be resolved. Here it's been heightened because we have two antecedent phrases. We have a, a first phrase that ends on a half cadence, and then rather than resolving right away, we get a second half cadence after that. Phrase two also ends on five, and it isn't until our third phrase that we shut the door and give that strong closure that we're looking for with a perfect authentic cadence. The three phrase period works just the same as our regular period, but we're just stretching it out a little bit by adding in that extra phrase. The last variant on periods we'll look at is the double period. A double period is typically four phrases long, and it has that same antecedent consequent relationship. We're looking for the same weak cadence, strong cadence relationship here, but rather than looking at it between two phrases, we're going to look at it between two phrase groups. We're going to look at a grouping of two phrases that ends with a weak cadence, and then another grouping of two phrases that ends with a strong cadence. This means that the cadences we're paying particular attention to are at the end of phrase two and phrase four, and they have that open, closed relationship, that weak, strong relationship. Let's take a look at an example of a double period. My example has gotten longer now. It is four four measure phrases, and we can see I have done some analysis and labeled the cadences for you. We can see that our first phrase ends in a half cadence, and our second phrase ends in a half cadence. This is not a period, right? We don't have that weak cadence, strong cadence. The cadences are exactly the same. Our third phrase also ends in a half cadence, but our final phrase, our fourth phrase, gives us that perfect authentic cadence. When we listen to this example in a moment, we're going to pay attention to the phrase groups, to the first two phrases as a group and the second two phrases as a group. And we notice that at the end of our first phrase group, our first eight measures, we have that weak cadence. And at the end of our second phrase group, the end of our last eight measures, we have that strong cadence, that antecedent consequent relationship. Let's listen for that as we listen to this example of a double period. We might also notice that our last eight measures form a typical period inside of this double period. Phrase three ends with a half cadence, and phrase four ends with a perfect authentic cadence. This is not uncommon to have one period hidden inside of our double period. Let's check out a phrase diagram for this phrase. We see we have four small arches for each of our different phrases, and you can see I've labeled all the cadences for them. Three half cadences in measures four, eight, and 12, followed by a perfect authentic cadence in measures 15 and 16. I've labeled the motives in each phrase. The first two phrases in the final phrase all have the same motivic material. They all have the same melody going on, and so I've labeled them all as A, though since the final phrase has some different things happening, I've labeled it as A prime, a slight variation on A. The third phrase is different though, and so I've labeled it as B. I've then labeled each of my double periods with larger arches. I've got a contrasting period that I can find between phrases three and four, and then a giant arch over the whole thing to show that this is a contrasting double period. We'll spend some more time reviewing period in class, but I want to spend the rest of this video talking about one other formal unit we'll be looking for in music, and that is what we call sentence. Sentence is a musical structure of variable size. We can find sentences that are very small, that occur in just a few measures, or we can find sentences that are a little bit larger and span a couple phrases. A sentence is characterized by having three parts. It has an initial idea, it has an immediate repeat or variation of that initial idea, and then a drive towards a cadence. 
Okay, those are the three parts. You hear an idea, you hear that idea repeated, sometimes exactly repeated or sometimes with a minor variation, and then we hear different material that pushes us towards a cadence. The duration of these parts is often in the ratio of one to one to two. So perhaps our initial idea would be one measure, it would be repeated as one measure, and then the drive to cadence would be two measures. Or maybe the initial idea is four measures, and then the repeat is four more measures, and the drive to the cadence is eight measures. That ratio is something that we see pretty commonly in our sentences. Let's look at some musical examples of sentence structure. A musical phrase, and I have labeled the parts of the sentence for you. The initial idea I've labeled as X, the immediate repetition labeled as X prime. Here, it's a slight variation because it's been transposed up a step. And then the drive to a cadence, the drive to an imperfect authentic cadence. Let's listen to this idea. We know this is a sentence because it's got the pattern we're looking for. It starts with an idea, bum ba da dum. It follows with an immediate variation of that idea, bum ba da dum. Same idea, same rhythm, same shape, just put up, pushed up by one note, and then a drive to the end of the phrase to a cadence, yum ba da ba da ba ba bum bum bum. In this case, again, an imperfect authentic cadence. This is a sentence that fits inside of one phrase, and that is a common way we will see a sentence as sort of fitting inside of a single phrase. But it doesn't have to be that way. Let's look at one more version of a sentence. This is a sentence that is slightly larger. This is a sentence that fits into a period structure, into a two phrase model. We can see I've labeled the first half of the sentence, and it's the first two measures. After that, in measures three and four, we have an immediate repetition of our first idea. Again, I've re it's a slightly varied repeat. It occurs just moved up a note, but again, the rhythm is the same, and the contour is the same. And then we have drive to a cadence. We push towards a cadence with something that is twice as long as one of those units. Two measures, two measures, four measures. Let's take a listen to this sentence structure, which is also a, which is also a period, a, a contrasting period, looks like. sentence structure, something that we'll be looking for in music, again, characterized by an idea, a repetition of the idea, and then a drive to a cadence in that proportion of one to one to two. Period and sentence are very common musical formations. We see them in musics from lots of different traditions in lots of different styles. And so as we look for them, we want to just remember how they function. In period, we're looking for groupings of phrases that have that weak cadence, strong cadence pattern. A feeling of openness in the first phrase, followed up by a closed feeling in the second phrase. With sentence, we're looking for motivic variation, an idea, an immediate variation on that idea, a repetition, and then that push to the cadence to close off the sentence. Okay? Both of these common ways to create music, common ways to organize musical ideas, and so, as we wanna so we wanna be looking for them so that we can recognize them in the music that we perform, that we listen to, that we study. I'll reiterate one more time, this stuff covered in chapter 10 of our textbook, strongly recommend you taking a look at some of that for more examples and for some different wordings and explanations. Thank you for watching, bring your questions to class, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.